Hey guys, Buildzoid here with yet another RX 480 PCB breakdown video for you. Today, the Sapphire Nitro. So this is one of the uh, custom RX 480 PCBs. And uh, before we start taking a look at the PCB, I need to cover something. So what you see right here on the screen right now is not what you can currently buy because uh, there's two versions of the PCB. This is the nicest photo I've seen of the older version, and I haven't seen a good photo of the newer version. Um, but really, the only difference between the old version, which you can see right here, and the new version, is that the new version is missing some of the bits of the old version. So yeah, the old version was better, but I guess too expensive for them to keep making it. So yeah. This is the retail version of the card, and as you can clearly see, down here we have a missing, you know, missing uh, inductor, missing uh, power IR stage, and a missing capacitor. Uh, whereas on the old card, th that's all still present. Um, so th for the purposes of this video, I will just ignore this entire section's existence. Doesn't exist. And let's roll on like nothing changed. So yeah, this is, a, this is an RX 480 Sapphire Nitro, and First things first, let's identify all of the main voltages. So for this one right here is of course V-Core. Above it we have a voltage, I'm not sure which one that is. And over here we have, I'm not sure which one this one is either. Now both of these are the exact same components. The only difference being no, nope, there isn't a difference. I thought there was a difference, but that's a 15 volt capacitor. Whereas there's a 15, well, that's a 16. I can't read. That's also a 16. They don't make 15s. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. So there's literally no difference. Same number of capacitors in both of them. Same number of multi multi-layer ceramics. So yeah, exactly the same components on both of those. And I'm just not sure which one powers what. One of them will be taking care of the GDDR5, and one of them will be taking care of the GPU's memory controller, which I think is some, which is somewhere on the edge of the GPU. I'm not sure where. So, yeah, one of them takes care of the memory controller. One of them takes care of the uh, actual memory chips, and they're both the same exact components. So whatever you know, so I'll just cover one of them and say if it's do, yeah, basically I'll cover it anyway. Um, and down here we of course have the 0.95 volt uh, rail which takes care of display stuff inside the GPU. So yeah, and before we get onto the actual analysis of each of the VRM's components, I'd also like to point out that this is one of the few RX 480s with a BIOS switch, which is in my opinion a really, really worthwhile feature if you want to get into uh, BIOS modding, because apparently it's now completely doable ever since uh, the 16.9.2 driver from AMD no longer checks for BIOS signatures, so you can go crazy on making custom BIOSes, and this switch is what you're going to need to do. That switch will make your life much easier than if you, uh, if you screw up with something. So, yeah, definitely a nice feature to have. The other card that has this is the Power Color Red Devil, but as I said in that video, that's really not a card I'd want to get unless if if I was into like extreme overclocking. For other uses, it's fine, but for extreme overclocking, I'd be kind of worried that you might you know damage the PCB in some way. So, yeah, stick to well. This card's actually perfect for. Uh, air-cooled and water-cooled overclocking, as you'll find out soon enough. So, what are the VRMs actually made up of? So, first things first, let's cover core voltage. Core voltage is a 1, 2, 3, 4, doesn't exist, 5 uh, phase VRM. So this is less than most of the other, actually not most, all of the other RX 480s. Every other RX 480 has 6 phases. But, do not be fooled. Having five phases does not necessarily mean that your VRM is weaker than everybody else's, okay? Because this here five phase VRM packs 40 amps per phase at 125 degrees. Holy freaking crap. So basically this powers the GPU core and you get 200 amps available to you. Very, very nice. And you get 200 amps because these guys right here are Power IR International, uh, Power, 
power IR stages, which are inter fully integrated, basically driver IC, high side MOSFET, low side MOSFET, uh, you know, fully integrated into one little IC, and that's made by International Rectifier, and these are the 3553s, and these are 40 amp parts. Each of them is rated for 40 amps, uh, average current draw, so uh, you can have spikes above that and dips below that. Uh, the spikes can be up to 60 amps for 4.5 milliseconds, which is actually kind of, that's really long actually, because GPUs can change their power state, uh, at least the modern GPUs can t change power states in like milliseconds. Uh, or at least the Fury could do that. I'm not sure if the RX 480 continues with that. I'm sort of suspicious, like I just hope that AMD didn't go and just throw out power management technology just because, you know, let's throw out power management technology. But it is possible that they, you know, change some power management things. But still, you get a lot of, you know, current available here. So how does this stack up to, say, the reference card? Well, at 125 degrees, this is better than the reference card. But as you start lowering the temperature, the reference card starts getting an advantage because the 3553 by design can never ever exceed that 40 amp rating. And unfortunately, the data sheet doesn't specify why, but I'm gonna have it as a guess that it's because the solder attaching the these guys, the solder attaching these guys to the PCB can't c carry more current than 40 amps before l heating up and melting. Um, that is a actual possibility for a lot of different MOSFETs and depending on how a MOSFET is, like depending on how the package is built, so the actual uh, casing of the silicon that makes up the MOSFET is you know, built, that can actually be weaker than the silicon inside it. So I suspect that's the case for these. Um, because the, the, the data sheet basically tops out at 40 amps. And usually when a manufacturer tops out, flatlines the data, you know, their pa current draw graphs at a certain current rate, uh, current level, uh, regardless of temperature, it usually means it's because literally, like the rest of the MOSFET couldn't deal with it. It's not because the silicon couldn't deal with it. So unfortunately, these at low temperatures actually perform worse than the reference card and a few other as well as a f uh, some of the weaker RX 480s. This is not, however, the most powerful RX 480. The Strix, which I covered ages ago, is way more, you know, way more capable VRM because that also uses power IR stages, except it uses the 3555, which is the 3553's uh, bigger brother. And that thing can do 60 amps per, per phase instead of just 40. Still, very, very nice VRM, and also this VRM at really high temperatures is by far one of the best. At 125 degrees or, uh, you know, no heat sink and some airflow, basically, is the scenario we're talking about here. This VRM can handle the most amount of current out of everything except basically the Asus Strix. Um, the Asus Strix is, you know, based off, is very similar to this, just better. So... This is by far like one of the better ones for really high VRM temperature. So if you're considering uh, doing a heatsink swap on this card for a bigger heatsink or just a core only water block or some kind of you know cooling setup where you're gonna get less than optimal VRM temperatures because you're not gonna have a heatsink on this, right? Then this VRM is actually perfectly capable of dealing with that scenario because it can you know. It can do its full, it can do 200 amps at 125 degrees, which is better than reference, better than both the gigabyte and the, um, and the power color. And then it lose, and it should still be better than the XFX card, but that's arguable because the XFX card gets really close to this thing's uh, average rating in its continuous rating on the high side at the same temperature. And then, yeah, the Strix is better because the Str Strix has a phase more, and actually no, the XFX also has a phase more, so the XFX is also better than this. But yeah, th this is a very, very good VRM. Um, you, you know, definitely capable for day-to-day -day overclocking, definitely capable even for extreme uh, water-cooled or air-cooled overclocking. I absolutely would not worry about this VRM under basically any c scenarios. And I, I, I'd, I'd suspect that actually going up from this VRM spec doesn't really net you any major gains in terms of overclocking range because already the reference card's VRM is plenty capable. 
Uh, this has slightly more advanced, so the cool thing about these guys is they're slightly more advanced than regular VRM components because not only are they everything completely integrated, they have their own current sense and their own current balancing system in them. So they will actually, uh, well, voltage control system built into them, not current. Uh, current is dictated by this guy because this right here monitors, you know, the current through every single phase. So we can adjust the current going through every single phase depending on the scenario. Uh, but these guys can actually control the voltage that they're putting out very, very, very care carefully. So, yeah, that's, uh, so this VRM should be one of the cleaner running ones. And it's definitely, you know, powerful enough, so I'd say good VRM right here. Now, above that, we have the, uh, I don't know if it's auxiliary or memory VRM. Either way, it doesn't matter because they're both the same. And this right here is a 4C10, so that's the from on semiconductor, and that has 34 amps at 80, 80 degrees um, case temperature. So 34 amps at 80 degrees. We've seen these before, so that's the high side fat, so you can probably expect that to do something like 40 amps uh, continuous, well, average, you know, phase current, like total current through the phase. Uh, the low side is two of those in parallel. So those are, again, the same MOSFET, 4C10s again. So really, again, pr plenty powerful for powering the GDDR5. You know, so the GDDR5 only pulls around 30 to 40 watts. So it's definitely plenty powerful for powering that. Uh, and then the auxiliary voltage, again, is like 10 to 20 amps. Like, it's really low power. So it's plenty powerful for that as well. So there's no complaints about uh, either of those. So both of those are perfectly capable. Uh, the core voltage is very, very capable. And this guy doesn't matter because you can't control it and it's super low power. So overall, this is a very nice RX480 PCB. I'd definitely say if you have it, good for you. If you're pl thinking about buying it, go right ahead. Um, because there's really nothing nothing wrong with it here. I mean, sure, it has, you know, five phases instead of six, but it's not really, that that shouldn't really impact your voltage, uh, that your overclocking, because the voltage stability coming out of those five, like, you can get five phases to perform basically the same as six phases, depending on the, depending on how you set things up. So, Sapphire can totally get away with running a five-phase VRM and competing with six-phase VRMs, uh, you're not going to have a major disadvantage just because of the phase count change. As far as current goes, this is one of the better VRMs uh, doing 200 amps at 125 degrees. So, yeah, de definitely a, a good card to go for. Uh, and I really have nothing to complain about. So, yeah, that's that for the, the analysis part of the video. So, if, you know, you don't want to listen to me ramble on about some some updates, this is the part of the video where you scroll down, you press the like button, or and then if you're not subscribed, you go and press the subscribe button. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the comments section down below. So, and that's the end of the, oh, wait, no. And if you would like to support what I do here on a, uh, actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon, you can find that in the video description down below the video. So, you can go there and do that. Um, so yeah, that, that's that for the PCB analysis part. So thanks for watching, and goodbye to those of you who don't care about me talking about stuff. So now me talking about stuff. So I've been sick for a bit, which is why th this video is so late. Uh, the other thing is, uh, yeah, so I've been sick. I was also in the Czech Republic, and I wanted to up, uh, do a video about the basement, but because I, uh, the basement being where actually hardcore overclocking sort of started, so that's literally my parents' house, that's the basement in my parents' house, right, and that, that basically became my computer lab because the, they, like, my computer just put out way too much heat, and they also kept banning me from using the computer, so that, that was fun, because, yeah, so I was, Per basically perma banned from using the computer and it just became a huge hassle for me to just move this like big desktop computer you know from my room to my parent to, to some room where it would get locked up
So eventually it was, the decision was made that the computer would live in the basement and I would not get the key to the, the room it was in um, until I was, you know, allowed to use it again. So yeah, and eventually they stopped banning me so much from it, and that became the actually hardcore overclocking lab, and that's where I sort of started out doing everything I do here now. So I wanted to do a video about that place, except I was sick, so I couldn't do that. However, I did get a chance to pick up a lot of awesome equipment, uh, like a noise level, uh, a noise level meter. Uh, some power supplies, because having extra power supplies is always a good thing. A ton of fans, so I'm actually planning on doing a, basically fan reviews. Uh, so I'll be going through all those fans and testing them out at different RPMs and noise and temperature performance. Because I don't want to just do pure airflow performance, because the thing about pure airflow is like... I want to know if it actually makes much of a difference, you know, it's like, yeah, we can see that this fan pushes twice as much air, but your temperatures aren't going to be twice as good. They just aren't. So I want to see what kind of a difference they make in the real world. Because do remember that temperature is literally like, you know, if you have a fixed uh, heat load, then your temperatures are going to be bound, uh, your temper, your minimum temp, your, basically, your Ah, I'm, I'm not going to try explain it right now. I'm still recovering too much. Screw it. Um, but yeah, so I'll be doing fan reviews. You will be seeing that on the blog. I refuse to do vi uh, reviews in video format. First, because it would need a ton of editing work. Secondly, because I just think reviews in a video format are dumb. So I'm not going to do them. And yeah, so that's that. So look forward to that. Um, what else is there? Oh, I got the e-power. I brought the e-power back. So that's nice. And I got a bunch of AI, uh, and I also brought over two AIOs, and I brought over my Fury, so I can run three-way crossfire again. Not four-way, unfortunately, because that Fury X that is probably dead is still in the probably dead state. Um, so yeah, so lots of fun stuff planned in the future. Uh, you can look forward to that, and that's that. I just sort of wanted to let you know about that. And see you guys all next time. Thanks for watching and goodbye.